All right, we're going to page 13. Get my camera going. There we go. Conjunction. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up cars and sentences. And I forgot the rest of the words of the song. It's the Schoolhouse Rock song. I will send it to you one of these days. I will send it to you so you can listen to it and then you'll be singing with me. It is a conjunction connects words, phrases, or clauses. A coordinating conjunction connects the same type of words, phrases, or clauses, and the items must be grammatically the same. Two or more adjectives, two or more prepositional phrases, and so forth. So remember fanboys, the good old fanboys that we used last year? Give me a thumbs up if you remember fanboys. Good. Aubrey is wasn't with us last year, so let's review fanboys really quick. By the way, it's just a acronym. It's a fun way to remember what the coordinating conjunction words are. So we're going to write it. Let's just put it at the top of your page here. At the very tippy top, I want you to write fanboys in all caps like that. And then we're going to list them and we're going to kind of squeeze it in here. But F, okay, just unmute and say what F is for. Four. Good, four. So I'm just going to add the O-R here. A. And. Good. N. Nor. Nor. Kylie's got it. B. But. But. With one T. O. Or. Or. Y. Yet. Yet. S. Oh. So, so if you read it this way, Aubrey, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. And it spells out fanboys. Those are the coordinating conjunctions. So if you can remember fanboys, you can remember all the coordinating conjunctions in English. Okay. Ian, there you are. Do you have your book yet? Oh, good. And your binder? Yeah. I have my book and my binder. Yay. Good, good, good. Talking about commas next right here. It says, oh, by the way, look at fanboys right here too. In fact, let's circle this. On the side, gives you a little clue here. So that's good to memorize. Commas, we have some comma rules. So do not use a comma before a co coordinating conjunction when it connects two items in a series, unless they are main clauses, then you need a comma. But if they're two nouns, they're two adjectives, they're two verbs, whatever, whatever the type of word it is, if there's only two of them, you don't need a comma. You do if you have three. Like here, the pattern is A comma B comma and C. So if the boy is riding his bike to the store, buying some milk, and going to his friend's house, it's three things, right? He's riding, he's buying, and he's going. And those are now, or no, those are verbs, by the way. So connecting three types of the same type of word there. All right. If, if the flower is yellow, beautiful, and large, those are three adjectives you would use commas between. Write CC above each coordinating conjunction, insert or remove commas, follow the comma rules. The toddler was lively, but defenseless. And notice the CC here is but, that's the B in fanboys. And since they're only lift, listing two, these are gonna be um, adjectives really, lively and defenseless you're only listing two, you don't need a comma for that. But look at this next one. He climbed a hill, peeked inside the cave, and wandered in. So we've got our coordinated conjunction and, and it's connecting three verbs this time. Climbed, peeked, and wandered. 
Okay. So you got to look for the, those words that are the same type of word. We're going to talk about the prepositional opener next, number two. You already do know number one, which is the subject opener. So now we're moving on to number two, prepositional opener. It's a sentence that begins with a prepositional phrase. The first word in the sentence must be a preposition. And then there's some comma rules to go with that opener. If a prepositional opener has five words or more, go ahead and circle five words or more. And then you can circle that comma to help you remember five words or, mo or more, I need a comma. It's weird, you have to count the words in a prepositional phrase. Less than five words, no comma. And you're gonna mark it with a number two or prepositional phrase, prepositional opener. And it says insert or remove coll commas and follow the comma rules. Here's the first example. Inside the cave, the wolf cubs wrestled with their mother. Prepositions here inside the cave and with their mother. And since this is less than five words, we only have three words here, you don't need a comma. Inside the dark and dank cave, the wolf cub, cubs wrestled. One, two, three, four, five, six words there. So you do need a comma. Do not include the opener in the main clause square brackets. So that's something to remember when you're looking for a main clause, do not include the prepositional opener. From the entrance of the cave, comma, father wolf watched. Oh, by the way, we've, we kind of skipped over this rule up here that says if two or more prepositional phrases open a sentence, follow the last phrase with a comma. So since there's two here next to each other, boom, boom, we got two in a row in the beginning, you do need a comma for that. All right, any questions about this page? No? Okay. There's more on the back. Phrasal verbs. Phrasal verbs. We know what verbs are. We've heard about action verbs, linking verbs, helping verbs. Now we've got phrasal verbs. Just when you thought you knew everything about verbs, here's something new. Aubrey, did you have a question? Yes. Um, is to a preposition? Um, T-O? Yes. It is, but it depends on how it's used in the sentence because if it's right before a verb, like to watch or to play, then it becomes an infinitive, which is different. So did you see an example that you had a, like right here? Oh no. Did you see an example or you're just asking? Um, I saw an example on last week's homework. It was, mm. it was oh. too trouble. To trouble. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Let's look at it really quick. Shere Khan's, I'm looking at page 11. Shere Khan's distant roar alerted father wolf to trouble. So in this sentence, that's a good question. Let me look at this. Um, it is a prepositional phrase there. So that is correct. Did you underline it as a prepositional phrase? No, I didn't because in the one that we did as a class, you said to kill wasn't a prepositional okay. phrase. So I got... Okay, good point, Aubrey. I'm really glad you're, you're bringing this up. That's a really good point. To trouble is a prepositional phrase because to is a preposition. And I know which one you're talking about last time, this one, to kill. And we know kill is actually a verb. It's an action, right? So whenever you have the word to next to a verb, it becomes what's called an infinitive. So it, it's not a preposition because remember prepositional phrases do not have any verbs in them. Remember? 
That's one of the rules with those phrases. So we can't count this as a preposition because kill is actually a verb. So the, to answer your question, your initial question, yes, the word to is a preposition, but it depends on how it's being used in the sentence. If there's no verb next to it, then it is a prepositional phrase. If there is a verb next to it, it's it's not. It's called an infinitive. Okay. Does that answer your question? Pretty much. And while we're thinking of it, um, I just want everybody to take a peek at the very, very last page. Remember, this is like literally the last page of your book. It's page 200. Page 200. Just flip over there for a second. It's good to see where this is at. Literally the last page. So if you go to the back cover and look at the page right before that, page 200, you've got your list of prepositions right here. And two is listed there. So this is a good page to refer back to. If you struggle with prepositional phrases, look back on this and see if one of these words is in the sentence you're looking at. And um, just remember that a phrase though will not have a verb in it. So make sure that if it does have a verb, then recheck it because it's probably not a prepositional phrase. You can even put a post-it note back here to help you remember that page if you need to. It's, it is the last page, so it's kind of easy to find. <laughs> All right, good questions though. I love it. Um, okay, phrasal verbs, we were just talking about that. They function as a single verb, but has another word with the verb. So these happen sometimes in English. English, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard, but it is actually the, I'm going to say it's the most difficult language to learn, but it could be second to Chinese. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying, um, but it's up there. Okay. A lot harder to learn than other languages like Spanish um, because things change all the time. And so how do you keep track of it? Like in Spanish, things are the same every single time. You don't have to wonder. Um, okay. So the combined words form an idea that is different from the two individual words. To cry means to shed tears. Out means away from. To cry out does not mean to weep away from, but to shout something. There's a perfect example. To cry out is to shout, right? But like they said, cry by itself means, you know, tears coming down, out, away from. So cry out is a phrasal verb. So that's what we have in English. We have some of these too. So you're just still going to write a single V above the phrasal verb. So here's your example. The boy could not catch up with the wolves. Catch by itself is a verb. Up by itself is not a verb. But when you put those two words together, catch up, and we're not talking the red stuff that you put on your French fries, catch up. That together makes a phrasal verb. So you're going to put a little bracket with a V on top of it. And here we've got this pronoun usage agreement. Um, there's different times to use pronouns when you're um, replacing a noun with it. If it's subjective, objective, or possessive, those are different ways to use these pronouns. And notice there's singular and plural. You guys know singular is one. Plural is, is more than one. And then first, second, and third person. So first person is you speaking, and you're included in the sentence, I and me and things like that. Second person is you still talking to somebody right in front of you, right? You're talking to them. And then third person is when you're talking about somebody else that's not even with you, okay? Another character, another person. So across here, First person singular, I, me, my, mine. Second person, you, you, your, yours. Third person, he, she, it, him, her, it, his, her, its, his, hers, its. Plural, we, us, our, ours. Second person, you, you, your, yours. That stays the same. And then third person, they, them, their, theirs. Okay, it depends on what um agreement pronoun agreement is in the sentence any questions about the pronouns or these phrasal verbs okay thank you for shaking your head ian i need your camera on when you get a second 
Look at these examples down here. I did not hear my mother call me. A character is speaking about himself. So he says, I. Um, uses first person row to speak about himself. He uses I, my, and me. These are all first person. He's talking about himself. Here's another example. You did not hear your mother call you. A character is spoken to. The speaker uses pronouns in the second person row to speak to someone else, like if they're right in front of them. He did not hear his mother call him. A character is spoken about. The speaker uses pronouns in the third person row to speak about another character. So you've got, you're speaking about yourself in first person, you're speaking to someone in second person, and then the third person is you're speaking about someone else. So to correct these, and you're going to have to find the errors, they're going to make mistakes on purpose. You're going to draw a line through it and put the correct pronoun. The wolf cubs ignored Shere Khan. He could not scare them. So he is referring to um, Shere Khan, right? And them is the wolf cubs. And it's plural because there's more than one cub. All right, questions about that page? Okay, practice page, page 15, all right. Um, anybody feel like reading it today? I know Kylie usually volunteers. How about Alex this time? Thank you, Kylie. I saw your hand first, but let's we'll see if Alex can do it this time. With great apprehension, Father Wolf paced. A small, hairless creature wandered into the shallow cave and joined the six cubs and our mother. Okay. Feels a little awkward with that word hour there. I don't think that one's right, so keep that in mind. But the vocabulary is apprehension. Does anybody know how to explain that? What is apprehension? Kylie? I'm going to take a wild guess. Okay. Um, obnoxious. Not exactly. No, not really obnoxious. If you, um, apprehension, it means a fear or anxiety over what might happen. So when you anticipate something like you have to go to the dentist, you have a toothache and you know, you're probably going to need to get a filling. I'm just saying that's, that's one of the things in life we all have mm -hmm. to go through. I meant obnoxious. I forgot the word. You meant anxious? No. Yeah. Is that what you meant? Anxious? Yeah. yeah. Then you were right. You were thinking a different word, but that's right. Like if you're like a little worried about something, but here it says with great apprehension, that means he was pretty scared. He was worried and anxious. He paced, meaning he just was like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Oh no. How are we going to do this? Okay. So put a check by vocabulary and we've got three articles here. And you can um, go ahead and find those by yourself and label those AR. There's three. And then Aubrey, when you're ready, let's look for the six nouns. Um, one would be, would it be father wolf or just wolf? You're right. It is father wolf because that's kind of his title. So okay. it would be both. And the creature. Yep. Cubs. Yes. The mother. Yes. How many are there? There are six. So you have one, two, three, four. There's two more. Okay. Um. Dave. Yes. And the last one's pretty tricky. Um, to be fair, because it's actually apprehension. Because we talked about how that means like fear or anxiety, and those might be adjectives. But because it says with great apprehension. I'm going to have you guys underline that because that's actually a prepositional phrase. With great apprehension, that makes this a noun. Because remember, those phrases end on a pronoun or a noun. <clears throat> 
So good though, Aubrey, you got the other ones and that was tricky. Um, how about the pronoun Alex? There's a pronoun in here. Our, but it should be there. Good, I'm glad you caught that. It should be there like E-I-R because the mother belongs to them. Good job. And then we've got our coordinating conjunctions, which is the fanboys. So Matt, I need you and Ian to turn on your cameras and go ahead and tell me where the two coordinating conjunctions are. My camera is on. I don't know why you can't see it, but it's I see on. you now. I got you. I don't know why it is it I've it's been on. Oh, okay. Um coordinating conjunctions. We got two of them. Um uh, remember fanboys? Yes, hang on one second. Um small hairless creatures. No. Creature? These are going to be fanboys, like four and... Oh, wait, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, fanboys. Uh, um, and. There you go. And. 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 and, and. Uh, yep. So CC for coordinating conjunction. By the way, you can write fanboys up here next to it if that helps you remember for later when you go to do your homework. The coordinating conjunctions are the fanboy words. Um, prepositional phrases, let's actually do, well, we found one, I guess we could find one more. So Ian, do you see the other prepositional phrase? We already got the one. There's one more. Uh, a small hairless creature. No, it doesn't start with an article. It starts with a preposition. So the preposition is into. Into the shadow? Into the shallow cave, actually, because it has to end on a pronoun or noun, remember? So into is the preposition. The phrase is into the shallow cave. And notice there's no verbs in there. Now the main clauses, um, and that's back to Aubrey. And remember mm -hmm. the clue last time or during our lesson was to not include the opener. So, but there's two main clauses in here. Do you know where they are? Um, father wolf paste. Yes, very good. Father wolf paste. And a small hairless creature wondered. It's actually going to keep going all the way to the end of the sentence here. Okay. Keeps going all the way to mother. So good. Um, and remember those main clauses, they, they, are a complete thought. That's one thing to remember about main clauses. So if we stopped at wandered, you might be hanging like, where did they wander to and what happened? So you wanna make sure the main clause is a complete thought. Kylie? Can I do the um, subject verbs? Yes, please. I was just gonna ask you to do that, it's perfect. Okay. Uh, father. That's the subject, okay. And then paste. Paste is the verb. Next. Creature. Creature is the subject. Wandered. Good. Wandered is the verb. And there's one more verb that goes with creature. Hairless? No. Would so, it be into? No. Wandered. Okay. But what else? There's another ED verb in there. An action verb. Joint. There you go, joined. So the creature wandered and joined. And that's gonna lead us to some comma rules, but we might as well finish this, this row here. Um, the two openers, um, Alex, what are the two openers here? Um, a prepositional one, number two. Number two for this one. And the other one is here, a small hairless creature wandered just the subject one. Yes, that's the subject one because even though it starts with an article and it goes into an adjective, a couple of adjectives here, we come to the subject first. So you're right. So this is a number two opener, which is prepositional phrase, and then a number one opener, which is subject. Very good. 
I'm going to skip down here to the commas really quick. Because remember the rule for a prepositional opener, if you have five words you need or more, you need a comma, but this only has one, two, three. So we need to take out that comma right there. That's one comma rule. The other comma rule is this coordinating conjunction and this coordinating conjunction, they're just connecting two verbs. They're connecting wandered and joined. And so we don't need commas when we're connecting only two types of words. So we're going to take these out. So it just says, a small hairless creature wandered into the shallow cave and joined the six cubs and their mother. Um, so that's one, two, those are the three commas. Okay, you can do the capitals by yourself. I bet you guys can find those. It's with, since this is his title, it's going to be father and wolf are capitalized. A, one, two, three, and that's it. End mark period. We already, uh, oh, we didn't fix the number. We have a number here, six. Anytime the number can be spelled out in one or two words, you always spell it out. You don't want to put the actual number in there unless it's like a date. And then we already fixed the usage for hour. So that's it. We got it. Any questions about this practice page? Okay, good. Um, go ahead and get your stuff out from your binder. You guys worked on last week. You worked on the Maori passage. You wrote your keyword outline. Oh, wait, just kidding. You were working on Frederick Douglass. <laughs> oh, look at my notes here. You worked on Frederick Douglass. You guys wrote the first two paragraphs from your keyword outline. So just a little reminder, go ahead and get all that out. Go ahead and get out your binders and all the stuff for Frederick D Douglass and your keyword outline. Um, a couple of you forgot to double space. That is something that I'm really, really, really picky about. You have to double space your paragraphs. So if you're typing, I recommend whenever you open a new document and Word or Google Docs. Actually, Google Docs in my mind is easier on Google Classroom. The first thing you do before you even start typing your name is hit double space. It's at the top. It's a little icon, has a little up and down arrow, and you can select double space. If you need help figuring out which one it is, I'm sure somebody in your family knows about that. And then you start typing. So please, please, please double space. If you're handwriting it, please skip lines. Ian, are you listening? I'm trying to figure, you must have two monitors going, huh? Yeah. Okay, because it looks like you're looking away, but you must be looking at a different screen. Do you want to say hi to yourself? <laughs> okay. But Whoa, uh, I'm big. <laughs> but I, it's good to know you're looking at me and not something else, so that does help. Whoa, that's weird. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, I'm done looking at myself. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So if you're handwriting, make sure you leave spaces in between. Okay, leave, leave lines blank. What else was I going to tell you? Oh, you had two dress ups. Most of you remembered to underline them. A couple of you forgot. I'm not going to point out anybody's names, but that's one of the rules on the checklist is to underline the dress ups. You only have two L Y adverb and who, which clause. So it gets longer as you guys already know. All right. So let's look at your uh, keyword outline because we're going to keep going and go on to The third paragraph of Frederick Douglass. Years should be filled in. 
because that was part of your work. So we're down here at the bottom. Paragraph three, which is nice. It's a little bit shorter. And it's this paragraph at the bottom. So we're going to finish this up and we're going to move on to the next passage here just so we can keep moving. But I'm down here at the bottom of this page 21. This is Frederick Douglass. I'll just reread this just to get it fresh in our minds and then we'll start working on the keyword outline. Um, by the way, one, one strategy if you like to do this is to underline keywords as you go. So if you see some keywords, even if you underline too many, oh, that's good, or highlight, good, Aubrey. That's okay to do that. If you wanna underline or highlight words as you go, it kind of makes it a little easier when you come to do your keyword outline. Douglas returned to the United States and continued to speak against slavery. On July 5th, 1852, he delivered a speech that eventually became known as what to, what to the slave is the 4th of July. According to Douglas's biographer, it has been called the greatest anti-slavery oration ever given. An oration is just a, a famous speech, right? That, And we know some from Martin Luther King Jr. that are even more famous, but um, he this would be his famous speech from Dr Douglas. He was photographed and often looked directly at the camera to confront the viewer with his stern look. After the slaves were freed, he continued to speak out against separatist movements. Separatist movements. He died at the age of 77 and is remembered as one of the greatest men of his time. So he was a pretty serious guy. His life was rough. He had a lot of trials to overcome and he had a message and he had a purpose. So his life was definitely cut out for him with what he was going to do, which was to try to stop slavery altogether and at least make people aware of it. And so uh, one of the ways he did that was with how he looked in the camera. He was, and I think I showed you guys a picture of him last week, but um, very serious. You don't want to mess with this guy. He means business, right? And he got his message across, which was the main thing here. All right. So we're I'm going to fold this in half just so it fits in my camera here. We're on paragraph three. So the first sentence is down here. I'm going to have Aubrey go first. It says, Douglas returned to the United States and continued to speak against slavery. Do you have any ideas on how we can document that in our outline? We, we could put a D for Douglas. Okay. And we could put returned and then the US just for like the abbreviation. Yeah, I like that. Um, and we could put continued and speak. Could that would I, be good. Oh, was there something could, more? I don't, I don't know. Just that. Oh, I want to hear you next. Do you have another idea? Mm, you could put handcuffs. As oh, yeah. For slavery. I think that word slavery is super important, though. I think we should keep that one. And maybe we can. Maybe we can decide. We could draw something for speak. Or just put speak and slavery. What is your idea, Kylie? Sorry, Jonathan. Uh, I was just thought of just writing out the word slavery and then putting a circle and a line through it. For what part? For, for the last. For slavery? Mm hmm Oh, circle the word slavery and put a line through it? Yes. For against? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's a good one. So then you can have speaking in it. Okay, so I think I'm going to go with that, but Aubrey, whatever makes sense to you. I like what you were talking about. And I think, is this what you're saying, Kylie, like this? Okay, so Douglas returned to the U.S. to speak against slavery. The only word we didn't use was continued. So, I mean, you could draw an arrow if that helps you remember. Um, 
But remember, you guys can have your own ideas here. We can do different things on this. Um, and when you're ready, Alex, I'm going to have you do the next one, which starts on, on July 5th. So on July 5th, 1852, he delivered a speech that eventually became known as What to the Slave is the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a long title. Um, we could put 1852 um, speech. Okay. Um, and then the title, I don't know. Yeah, the title's long. What if we just, from the title, what if we just put um, slave and fourth and July like this? Slave, fourth, July, and a question mark. Because we could go back and look at the title if we needed to when you go to write that paragraph. But that might help you. That might be enough to remind you, oh, yeah, what to the slave is the 4th of July. All right. And then, Matt, how about the next sentence starts with according to. Uh, I'm looking for it. According to. Where is the. Oh, wait. We're at the bottom paragraph right here where it says. Oh, I think I, th I think I found. Wait, where are you at? According to Douglas. Oh, okay, no, I got. Okay, I got it now. All right. According to Douglas's biographer, it has been called the greatest anti-slavery orientation ever given. Yeah, and that word is oration. Oration, Actually, rather. It's a weird word. Yeah. Okay, so. I don't know if we need all that about his biographer. We just, I think the main point of that sentence is that it was the greatest oration ever written, greatest anti-slavery. So we can just put that. So what three words of that would you put to remember? Um, Probably an greatest anti-slavery oration. oration. Yeah, okay. That's what I'm just going to put. Yeah, I like that. Greatest oration. Oh, I forgot. It doesn't matter. It's fine. I'm going to draw isn't. an arrow so I can remember to put it there. Anti-slavery. So greatest anti-slavery oration. Okay, Ian, and when you're ready, go ahead and turn your camera on. And do the next one about how he looked in the camera. How are we going to record that on our keyword outline? This part right here. He was photographed and often looked directly into the camera to confront the viewer with his stern look. Uh. He was photographed and often looked directly at the camera to confront the viewer with his stern look. Yeah. Uh, maybe like draw some eyeballs right there. Okay. We're like looked okay and then like uh camera okay and you guys can write something different if you have something different there uh
Sturm Luck. Yeah. That'll work. Um, Aubrey, we're going to finish this up. So Aubrey, do number four. After the slaves were freed, he continued to speak out against separatists' movements. Um, we could do... An S for slaves. Okay. And then you could write freed. Okay. Um, and you can write speak and separatist. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And maybe we could circle separatist and cross it out like we did slavery up here. You like that idea? Okay. Separate A-T- I S T S. Separatists, obviously, we see the word separate in there, and it basically means keeping people separate. There are certain people in the world, even today, that believe that we should be separate, separated from certain types of people, whether it's their culture or the way they look or what they identify as. So um, in this day, in the 1800s, it was the blacks, right? They were some separatists believe that they should be separate than the white people. So he spoke out against that. So that's why we circled it and crossed it out. So the last sentence, um, Kylie, it says, he died at the age of 77 and is remembered as one of the greatest, greatest men of his time. Um, this is going to sound bad. Uh, draw a face with two X's on it. We've done that before. It's not yeah, bad. Yeah, sounds bad. And then um, straight line. <laughs> yeah. At the, I, and I just wrote 77. At 77, okay. Um, greatest, and then a stick figure, and then his time. Okay. Greatest. And I drew some poofy hair. I drew some poofy hair on his head. <laughs> greatest, his time. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. All right. Um, we're going to put, okay, so part of your homework is to finish this up here. Okay, you're going to finish up the third paragraph of your article, your report on Frederick Douglass. And you're going to use the same checklist. Okay, that checklist um, has on it, let's look at the checklist really quick. LY adverb and who which clause. And the other thing I wanted to point out on the checklist is this stuff up here is still the same. Make sure you double space, like I said earlier, but then you have titles. So now that you're going to finish the third paragraph, you're going to give this a new title. And it needs to repeat one to three keywords from the final sentence. So that very last sentence that talks about how Frederick Douglass was the great, known as the greatest man or one of the greatest men of his time. Use some of those words in your title. You can use one word or two or three, but it has to come from that final sentence. And then don't forget to include the dress ups here. So I want you to keep your checklist, your keyword outline, and Frederick Douglass in your front pocket, but we're going to put away the rest of the stuff from week two. And I want to talk to you about something in that stack. So when I say put away, I mean to put it away in your finished composition in a separate binder. We're not going to do Harriet Tubman, so we're going to put that one away in a separate binder. And by the way, I'm going through this kind of quick, but make sure you organize it, Matt, okay? This letter to the editor, I want you to hand this to your mom or your dad or whoever does most of your schoolwork at home with you. You can write your name here at the top. This is a letter to them telling them how they can help you with this class. 
Okay. It kind of goes into detail. It does talk about at the last paragraph, a way to pay them for your, for their help. And an example would be to do a task like the dishes or, um, take the trash out, or maybe those are things you already do, but something above what you normally do to, as a, as a payment for them helping you with this class, as far as editing your paper. So just give this later after class, give it to your mom or your dad or grandma, grandpa, whoever does your work with you at home. So set that aside so you can give that to them. Um, you can put this one in your finished compositions folder, wherever you're keeping your finished stuff. The yellow pages I'm gonna have you put in the actual binder. So I'll show you where those go in a minute. Any questions about how we're organizing right now? Okay, let me know so you know what to do. The stuff for Frederick Douglass, since you're still working on it, is going to stay in your front pocket of your binder. So make sure that goes there for your homework. Stick that back in there. So now we should be down to just these two yellow pages. I'm going to show you where these go. This one goes in model charts and outlines like we did the other one. I think we put one in there before. Just kidding, this is the first one. Huh? Oh no, there is one in there. This one, it should be already in there. So let me show you the tab. Model charts and outlines is way back here. I got it. You should already have this one in there from last time. And so this one goes behind it. So behind this one, should be this one that we have from this week. Stick it back there. And by the way, on your dress ups, you should have LY adverb and who which clause. Make sure those are written on there. And then you're going to put that behind stylistic techniques. There's a tab called stylistic techniques, and that goes back there. Kylie? You have a question? Kylie, did you have a question for me or no? Oh, okay. So that one that has the dress ups is stylistic techniques. Give me a thumbs up if you got all that put away. All right, good. Now go back to source text and get out week three. It's called Maui and the giant fish. So go ahead and carefully open up your rings, get out week three. It's a lot. You got pink pages, you got blue pages, you got yellow pages. Just take them all out till you see week four, leave that one. It should be one, two, three, four, five, six pages all together. And don't forget to close your rings before you close your binder. So you should have week three out Maui and the giant fish. So we're going to kind of, you're still working on Frederick Douglass. That's part of your homework is that last paragraph, but then we're moving on to the next. So we're kind of transitioning here, but don't forget to do the Frederick thing for your homework. We're going to start with um, yellow page 35, which is right underneath this front page here. It looks like this. And I bet you remember story sequence charts. You guys remember story sequence charts from last time? Good. We're going to do it again. And this is just a little reminder. Uh, next week, we'll set up our keyword outline like that with the boxes. I'll, I'll remind you how to set it up. But instead of line by line, like we've been practicing the last few weeks, we're looking for whole ideas here. So these are going to be made up stories. They're, the stuff we've been working on so far is more like articles and facts. Um, these are going to be stories. So you're going to have characters and settings. So the first paragraph, Roman numeral one, is all about the characters and settings. And you're going to be answering these questions. Who is in the story? What are they like? When does it happen? Where do they live or go? 
In the second paragraph is usually when you talk about the conflict or the problem. Should come back to you, right? What do they need or want? What do they think? And what do they say and do? So usually in any story or even movie or book, you start with the characters, introducing the characters. Remember when I used to talk about Kung Fu Panda? That was always the story that I brought up because the opening scene in Kung Fu Panda, the original one, the first one, is, is the Po, the panda, is playing with the little figurines, like the little action figures, right? And they're the, um, I want to say karate, but it, they're like, a, what are they called? Kung Fu team? You guys remember? <laughs> I can't remember what they're called. But anyway, you're you're learning about these characters. Like, what are their powers? What can they do? How do they work together? Us? Yeah. I have to leave. I have a doctor's appointment. Okay, Ian. I'll see you next week. I'm recording right. so you can hear the, the homework later. Okay. Okay. Um, bye. Bye. And then at the end is when you have that climax and resolution. And we talked about how that climax is like a mountain, right? It's the very top of that mountain. When the character gets to the point where he's either going to die or he's going to defeat the bad guy, right? And you, it's kind of like you're not sure if it's the first time you've read the story. That's called the climax. And then the resolution is how it gets resolved. So how is the need resolved? What happens after? What is the message or the lesson? And then it's got the title rule at the very bottom here. All right. So I just want to review that with you. Go to the blue page really quick because guess what? We're going to do band words next. Oh, yay. <laughs> Remember those? Yeah, these are the words that you're no longer allowed to use in your writing. We're going to add to this list as we go. But the first one, these are verbs, by the way. Um, I get to my list here. Is you probably guessed it, say said. So at the top here, put say slash said. So they really wanted you to focus on this one because you're writing about characters and they do talk. So rather than saying say or said, because those are kind of boring, you know, they're, they're common. We could use words like spoke or shouted. Go ahead and unmute if you can think of some other words that you can put here for say said. You can just say it. Cry out. Cry out. We just talked about that one. Whispered. Whispered, good. Replied. Replied, good. Declared. Good. Did I spell that right? Declared. I think I have an extra. Extra, is it declared A-I-R? Sometimes my spelling is not fantastic. I already told you guys that. <laughs> Let me just check it. Declared. No, no I. No I there. Just A-R. Declared. Okay. Anything else? Maybe explained? Trembled. Okay. Say that again. Trembled. Stuttered. Uh oh, stuttered. That's a good one. Trembled would be more like what he did. But stuttered is a good one. Okay. That's a good start. If you think of others, you can add to this list. Um, the next band word though is seesaw. Oh, dang it. <laughs> I know. Can't use see or saw anymore. Spied, spotted, what else? Watched, looked, watched, looked, observed, eyed, is eyed a word? Yeah, I like that, eyed. Found is one. 
that's a good start. There's more. So that's a good start there. And then go went. So we're putting three on here. So you can't use say or said or anything close to that or like saying or says anything that's close to that. Seesaw and now go went. Sauntered. Say it again. Sauntered. Sauntered? Mm -hmm. I like that. That's a good word. He's like ran. Walking. Ran? Is that what you said? That'll work. Tiptoed. Journeyed. Tra traveled. Traveled. Rushed. Drived. Dr oh, so that would be drove, but that's a good one. Drove. Yeah. Road. Road, good. Um, and notice we use past tense because most of the time when we write a story, we use past tense. That's why we just stuck with that. But that's a good list to start with. Did you think of one more? Drived. Well, not drived. I mean, like drive. Like what if it wasn't um, like the dialogue? It's like, I'm going to go drive there. Oh, drive? Like if it's present tense? Yeah, you could use drive. That would work. I kept my past tense here, but that's a good one. Um, okay, so we're going to pause there and continue this lesson next week. So your homework is your three grammar pages and then your third paragraph. So you're going to finish up Frederick Douglass. Don't forget to give it a title and make sure you include your LY and who which clause. Okay, any questions about homework? No? All right, then. That was it for today. So good job, you guys. See you next week. Make sure you put everything in your front pocket. Keep it organized in your front pocket there. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, bye.